Good afternoon, New York, and the rest of our listeners around the globe. My name is June Stoyer, and I'm the host of the Organic D Radio Show. Our podcast is available on iTunes, Zoom, and you can also visit our website at www.theorganicview.com. If you'd like to be on the show or would like to find out about sponsorship opportunities, please contact us at questions at theorganicview.com. Today's show is sponsored by Eden Foods, the most trusted name in certified organic clean food. When you shop online at EdenFoods.com, enter the coupon code ORGVIEW to receive 20% off any regularly priced items, excluding cases. For other promotional offers, please visit TheOrganicView.com's website. And don't forget to check out our contest section. On today's show, Tom and I have a number of topics lined up, including a discussion in Spain in which various regions are banning glyphosate herbicides over health fears. In Japan, there's a concern about neonicotinoid pesticides, which are killing dragonfly nymphs in rice paddies. Also, Tom is going to continue the discussion concerning Boulder County and the use of GMOs on public land. And we have a couple more things lined up if we have the time. Before we begin on the main topics, let me welcome to the show my co-host, Colorado beekeeper Tom Theobald. Good afternoon, Tom. Good afternoon, June. Spring has sprung. It's sprung here as well. We're, We're having a beautiful spring day today. Here in New York, it's raining, and apparently there's a cold front pushing through, but uh, the vegetation outside seems to be coming along. I'm just wondering when it's going to turn into 90 degrees. The first subject that we have is in regards to different regions in Spain that are banning glyphosate herbicides over concerns about the impact on health. There was several articles published about Germany, how the entire German population has been impacted by glyphosate. That was the one where uh, 99% of the people sampled had glyphosate in their blood. Is that what you're referring to? Yeah, that that was very recent. That was uh, just a few weeks ago. And now this is interesting that in Spain, they have major concerns over the impact of glyphosate on human health. More and more countries and municipalities are becoming concerned about the health consequences of glyphosate. And uh, we're seeing the consequences of that right here locally as a result of the decision made by the commissioners. And we can get into a little more of the detail of that further on. But uh, it's an issue everywhere. And the corporations are pulling out the plug to try to defend glyphosate. Glyphosate has been a key focal point for so many years as far as the impact of human health. It just makes you wonder, okay, how many people have to suffer before they remove this from the market? Apparently, uh, the entire population, we're all being exposed to it. Well, it'll be interesting to see if another region in Europe decides to push for a ban on the use of glyphosate. In Japan, the population seems to be very environmentally focused, especially with the use of systemic pesticides. And apparently at the National Institute for Environmental Studies found that these pesticides are killing the dragonfly nymphs in rice paddies. The Japanese have been concerned about the neonicotinoids on rice paddies for several years. And uh, one of the important findings from that are that were that uh, 68% of the pollen loads of bees was rice pollen. And to put something that's long-lasting, water-soluble, migrates with the groundwater into rice paddies seems to be insanity. And yet there, there seems to be nothing done about it. Two or three years ago, the USDA approved the use of clothianidin Uh, as a seed treatment and foliar application on rice paddies in California. It's the corporations that are in control here, and I think that's what's important for the people to recognize. We don't have a regulatory system. We don't have watchdogs. What we have are agencies that, that have been corrupted and overtaken by the corporations that they're supposed to oversee. They're not doing it. One of the most uh, dramatic examples of that is the exclusion of seed treatments from monitoring or control 
and seed treatments on genetically modified crops represent 95% of the usage, and yet the EPA has chosen to use a loophole excluding it from regulation or tracking. Finally, they were sued right after the first of the year, and once again, the EPA chooses to use my tax dollars and yours to defend their failed decision-making rather than revisiting that decision-making. They choose to use our tax money to defend themselves in court. This is a criminal enterprise, and I know people have probably gotten tired of hearing that, but this is a very carefully or orchestrated criminal enterprise, and public needs to start paying close attention and calling them to account because it's their health and the health of their children and grandchildren that is at stake here. These are massive poisonings of the environment. Well, Tom, we do have a lot of new people that tune in each week. So to a certain degree, I think it's necessary to repeat a certain amount of the information, especially since nothing has changed since the first segment that we've done together. I mean, realistically, what has changed since we've been doing the show for the last five, five years or so? Well, if there's been any change, it's only that it's gotten worse. And people need not only to listen, but to do a little research of their own and, and begin to speak out. As I said, these are massive poisonings of the environment, never seen before in human history. And these corporations are getting away with it. And they've convinced the farmers and much of the public that these are harmless and beneficial applications of technology. They are not. These people are profiting at the expense of the environment and at the expense of your health and mine. People tend to be really clueless as to the impact of the systemic pesticides. And if you think about a crop like rice, rice which must be grown in water, and the fact that these systemic pesticides are mobile in water, that's scary just the thought of it. So many different cultures depend upon rice as a key staple. Well, rice so it makes you wonder, what, what is the health impact of these people? And unfortunately, we do not have the science to back up any of the impact on human health because there isn't enough money to do so. That's basically what the scientists seem to be jointly communicating, that there just isn't enough money to do as much research to prove these things. But my question is, why do we have to get to that point? Why don't the chemical corporations do the testing prior to unleashing it onto the environment? Well, that's supposed to be the model. I guess my question would be, where is the medical community? Why aren't they sounding the alarm on these things? And well, when they can make money off of it, then they, they will. Are, but the medical community should be speaking out loudly and strongly here, and they're not doing that. To a certain degree, that's a little unfair because most of the medical professionals, bottom line, they're focused on the things that they're focused on. And once again, enough people haven't been impacted for it to be a major concern. Secondly, considering the fact that so many scientists are being ostracized for speaking up against the research that they're finding is also a big concern. I don't think doctors are willing to put their necks on the line to speak up about anything in particular until they have the solid proof. So it's almost as if they need one in order to do the other, but at what point do we have to wait in order for that to come about? Well, I think the backstory here is that the corporations have very effectively taken control of almost everything. We no longer have a government. We have a quasi-government that serves the interests of these corporations. I look at the uh, current presidential campaign, and I wonder if any of these people will have any effect on the course of events, or whether they're all just going to be puppets in one way or another for these corporate interests. The corporations have carried out their objectives very effectively. They're very good at what they, they do. It, whether their efforts are for good or for evil, they're very good at what they do. Well, so far, from what I understand, 
Bernie Sanders on the Democratic side has come out against GMOs and fracking. And Donald Trump's campaign is run independently. There was some something circulating that Ted Cruz is in support of GMOs, but that's something that has yet to be proven. But Hillary Clinton is openly pro-GMO and pro-fracking, so there you have it. The bottom line is is that even if Bernie or Trump got in, what's the guarantee? Oh, I don't think it makes any difference at all what they say. I, as I, I'm not a political wonk, but as I understand it, uh, President Obama ran on a platform where he was going to take control of many of these things, and he's conceded to industry one point after another. Yeah, especially with four GMO crops last term, and then this term, GE salmon was unleashed. Mm-hmm. So, and then there are so many discussions about other species that they're working on. So it's not something that is making progress as far as we're concerned. And if if anything, it's doing more damage than anything. Speaking of GMOs, what happened in Boulder, Tom? It's been two weeks since our last segment due to the Easter holiday. So. What exactly was the decision? Can you give our audience a little bit of the background and then talk about the decision? Sure. Uh, It's an interesting condensation of many of these questions. Boulder County faced the question of genetically modified crops on citizen-owned land six years ago and convened a committee that reviewed all the possibilities, and they came up with something called the cropland policy, a part of which provided for genetically modified corn and genetically modified sugar beets on county land with the provision that it be reviewed in five years. Well, the five years was up this year. It has been reviewed, and the result of that is little or nothing has been done. Part of the part of the cropland policy was that there would be a transition away from genetically modified crops. <clears throat> the commissioners had their their meeting uh, two or three weeks ago, and they each restated their positions. And in effect, aside from uh, Commission Chair Elise Jones, who said that uh, genetically modified crops should be ended at the end of 2016, as the cropland policy called for. Deb Gardner, who campaigned on uh, removing genetically modified crops, would agree to a three to five year extension of the transition. And uh, Cindy Domenico would call for a, a five to seven year extension of the transition. So we potentially could go through another seven years of transition with these genetically modified crops. Now, the focus has been glyphosate, which is what we were talking about earlier. But what is being overlooked is that all of those genetically modified crops come as seeds treated with the neonicotinoids far more damaging than glyphosate, even though there are very serious questions about glyphosate. The environmental destruction that has been uh, unleashed through these systemic pesticides is perhaps the greatest environmental destruction in the history of mankind. It has a lethal effect on many forms of many life forms at the lower end of the food chain, and it has devastated the environment. And the chemical companies have been very careful to steer the discussion away from that. And the commissioners gave a decision, but they gave no decision when they had their meeting. And now the the corporations, the Crop Life America, have arrived in town. And they are propagandizing against any control of genetically modified crops. Because if that should happen in Boulder County, that sets a precedent. And they don't want that. There was a series of interviews done last week on public radio here in Denver. And none of the opponents of the genetically modified crops were uh, interviewed. One of the leading genetically engineered farmers in Boulder County was interviewed, and 
made the claim that they are not corporate farmers, that they're just family farmers that have been in this for generations. And I, I happen to know the person, and I know he's a decent man, not an evil man as far as I can concern, but he claims not to be a corporate farmer, but they use corporate farming practices, and I have to ask if it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it seems reasonable to assume that it's, in, that it's a duck. Uh, but if you take a look at what happened with Percy Schmeiser, Percy Schmeiser, and folks, if you're not familiar with the Percy Schmeiser case, Google his name or go into the archive section on theorganicview.com and you can listen to one of several different interviews that I did actually several years ago with Mr. Schmeiser. And the bottom line is, once you plant the technology, the GMO seeds, it takes several years before your land becomes clean again. So it's a big process. So to a certain degree, Tom, the farmer that you're talking about has no choice. Because once he committed to using that seed, from what I understand, once you purchase the package and you open up that bag, you've already committed. I mean, that's how technical they've gotten about the whole process. I, I was pretty amazed. It's pretty intense, but to a certain degree, you can't blame companies like Monsanto because they are protecting their technology. It's just that it's not a technology that most people want. Well, you know, frankly, I'm getting a little tired of hearing the uh, poor farmer story. The person that was interviewed for public radio last week had uh, just under a half million dollars in federal subsidies over a 10-year period and is a leading advocate of these genetically modified crops. And the genetically modified crops are tied directly to these subsidies. If you are going to get the subsidies, you have to grow the genetically modified crops. This is a very intricately, carefully coordinated criminal enterprise, and the people need to stop being duped. Well, that might be the case, but once again, you have a farmer that has bought into the system. To paraphrase what you've said, you are dealing with a criminal enterprise, and it's not like you could just walk away. And when it comes to farming, once you've implemented this technology, you can't just undo it. It takes several years, and in the interim, how is the farmer supposed to survive? And I'm not defending the farmer by any means as far as the use of the genetically modified technology. I'm just trying to point out something that is very realistic when it comes to using this technology. But at the end of the day, the impact is how many more species are going to be impacted, including our own. When you look at the decline of the monarch butterfly, we're at a point where, what is the percentage, Tom? What is it, something like 90, 98% of the monarchs in America have disappeared? 90% in the last 20 years is what I've seen. And the monarchs are just one of the visible evidence. You know, the monarchs, and I've said this before, the monarchs and the honeybees and a few others have mentors. They have people who speak out for them and watch them and monitor them. There are thousands of other life forms at the lower end of the food chain who, that have no one to speak for them. The freshwater invertebrates. What happens when you begin to affect the freshwater invertebrates? That's the basis of the food chain for all sorts of uh, water organisms. You mentioned earlier the, the dragonfly nymphs. There's a good example. What happens to the fish? What happens to the fish population as these chemicals migrate and the effect of the chemicals migrate their way up the food chain? People need to wake up because we have to stop going down this road. These corporations need to be called to account. Well, that is all well and good, but who's going to call them into account? Well, We don't even have elected officials that are willing to do anything. Look at EPA. EPA is a disaster. It's clear that and the people are going to have to take the initiative here because the people that we're paying to do that for us are not doing that. And, in fact, they're doing the exact opposite. So unless the people rise up and speak out, it's only going to get worse. Be that as it may, Tom, there's an interesting article in SustainablePulse.com that was published on April 4th, and the title is Gates Foundation and U.S. Aid 
spread GMO industry control over traditional African crops. So it's kind of hard when you have somebody like Bill Gates, who's what, the wealthiest man in the world, that's pushing this. So people really do need to speak up, but at what point will they? They're starting to label foods in the supermarket here in America, but is that enough? Furthermore, how do you know when you're buying something that's local? Is it organic? Is Has it gone through the testing? And there's still a small percentage of contamination that's permitted. So the bottom line is, can you grow everything yourself in order to guarantee that everything is safe? And the answer now, to that is no. The vast... Magnet, the vast proportion of the American population cannot grow what they eat. Some can, and many people can have a garden, but most people are at the mercy of agricultural production, and that agricultural production has to be safe. It has to be something that they can rely upon, and that's the reason why we have created agencies like the EPA and the FDA and the USDA to assure that those objectives are carried out. Well, the corporations recognize that their interests are best served if they can corrupt those agencies and direct them in their own interests, and that's what's been done. They have enlisted these agencies into the criminal enterprise. Well, as I said, it's really a very, very large group of very powerful people that are running the show here and unless people start getting involved and they start voting with their dollars and I hate to sound so cliche but that's what it boils down to is when people start voting with their dollars and Tom you mentioned that this farmer was on public radio did it surprise you that they were going to push one particular view Oh, of course not. And in fact, it wasn't just public radio. There have been several editorials in both the Boulder paper and the Denver paper. And basically what they're doing is they're characterizing the people who question these technologies as Luddites, as scientific deniers. The sad thing is that these... uh, Editorials are based on ignorance, not on knowledge. These people haven't done their homework. And I would suspect that much of the editorial content has been served up to them by the corporations. And they don't have the uh, the interest in, in doing the homework to understand what they're being told and whether or not it's accurate. So they're, they're characterizing the opponents of these technologies as Luddites when they, in fact, are the Luddites themselves. Well, if they admit to what's going on, that's money. It's a, it's a corporate world. They all benefit from these activities. The last topic that I would like to discuss concerns fragrance. When it comes to spring flowers, many people sneeze, and actually a lot of people are sneezing. But are they also breathing in these toxins? If you think about the fact that these systemic pesticides are mobile in groundwater, and the fact that the damage is cumulative and irreparable, we talk about the contact with skin. We talk about the contact in the water if you're drinking it, but what about if you're breathing it in? Well, this is a question that came up in discussions between you and I not too long ago, and I'd never thought about it, but these, you know, one of the things that stimulated that question was the findings of the New Zealand study that found that bees are affected by the neonicotinoids at levels as low as 50 picograms. A picogram is a part per trillion. The question that came to my mind is, do those chemicals persist through the fragrance? Are they distributed into the environment by by way of the fragrance? And is that in sufficient amounts, parts per trillion, sufficient amounts to have an effect on anyone who smells those flowers? Take time to smell the roses, but it may not be a healthy activity. Well, if you think about the fact that these chemicals are mobile in groundwater, if they're in water, what's another form of water other than liquid water? Vapor. Mm -hmm. 
it makes sense. It's just we need the scientific studies to show the human health impact. The deeper we dig, the worse it looks. It does indeed. But the bottom line is, is that by the time I think we find out what the actual human health impact is, I just wonder, will we even be around? Well, the older among us may not, but I uh, just had, had an event in my life two weeks ago, my first great-grandchild, a boy. And I wonder, what kind of a world are we hang, handing down to that child? What problems will he have to confront? Because we didn't carry out our responsibility to assure him a safe and healthy environment. Well, Tom, I hate to end on that note, but you're absolutely right. And all the more reason why we do this show each week. And folks, if you've missed any of the segments that we've done, please check out the archive section on theorganicview.com. There's a link that's up at the top and there are over a thousand interviews that you'll find on not only on neonicotinoids, but other subjects that pertain to the environment. Well, Tom, to be continued, thank you so much for your time. To be continued, Joan, we have to continue because we're one of the few who are speaking out against this. We need many more people to take an interest and begin to speak out. Folks, if you do have any questions for us, please write to us at questions at theorganicview.com. Thank you for tuning in. Tune in next week as Tom and I continue the discussion. Have a great afternoon, everyone. This has been June Sawyer with the Organic View Radio Show.